online entrepreneurship as a freelancer or as a small web agency can be highly unpredictable in terms of money as well as workflow. How can you add more predictability to your online income streams? What all is needed for income flow that is predictable? Jason Resnick is here to talk about this and much more. So let's get started and welcome Jason on the show. Hi, Jason. How are you? Great. How are you doing? I am doing good. So before we get into the unpredictable territory of predictable income flow, why don't you give a quick introduction about your online life? Sure. So uh, most people know me as Res Online. That's with three Zs. And uh, I've, for the past nine years, I've run my own web development uh, business where I help establish online, mainly e-commerce businesses, get, get customers, get repeat customers, and create raving fans. And I do that through now a lot of behavioral marketing, email marketing, and on-site personalization. And in recent, basically the last 18 months, I've had a real big focus on helping other developers and designers figure out what their specialty and their niche is so that then they can also build recurring or predictable income. Awesome. So predictable income, that's right in your alley. So that's what we're going to talk about. So just starting off in very simple terms or in a very layman perspective, is predictable income something like I'll make minimum $5,000 every month or is there more to this concept? I mean, it's obviously a big, big concept, but yes, I mean, in the, the 30,000 foot view, it's knowing essentially how much you're going to make on a consistent basis uh, so that you know that your expenses are covered, your savings is covered, um, that you can then build that sustainable business and move that forward. Um, and that's a big part of how I've been able to build a solo based business for the past nine years. And is the concept of predictable income same or similar to recurring revenue or is there a difference if you scratch the surface? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it, a lot of people use recurring and that automatically puts somebody in the mindset of that they have to either sell a subscription-based sort of SaaS product, if you will, or some service that's you know, let's say $69 a month or something of that nature. So, uh, but in my world, it's services based. And so while I use predictable and recurring as interchangeable, um, because if you look at it, it should be interchangeable in semantics terms, um, but in the technical world and the world in which we live in, um, I try to always use them. I, I always preface like, hey, when I talk about predictable, recurring income, I mean predictable, because then it resets their, their brain, if you will, to the, hey, there's some sort of uh, difference here. Like we're not talking about a, a $69 product, we could be talking about a $2,500 a month service that you're offering. Okay. Now, most freelancers and even agency owners are into this project to project money flow with very little fixed predictable income you know uh, quantum now how does one start to prepare for income flow that's predictable like what is the groundwork that's required you have to know your customer your client you have to know exactly what it is that you're solving for them mm -hmm. and how to deliver that so that you can know exactly where your profits lie, how long things take, so that you can then go ahead and schedule out projects um, in a way where it's not just you reinventing the wheel each and every time a new project comes across your desk. So you want to start to look at, if you have existing clients already, um, you want to start to look at just really two sides of the same coin. One side is what what projects do I enjoy working on? Mm -hmm. What kind of clients, meaning personalities, do I like to work with? Um, and think about unpacking that a little bit more, but at a 10,000 foot view, like, is it nonprofits? Is it, you know, you know, city versus rural 
businesses? Is it, you know, like really come back and take a look at it from almost like an out of body experience um, so that you can generalize exactly what it is that you enjoy working on. And then the other side of that coin is the complete opposite. So like, why do you not like working on certain projects? Why do you not like working with other people? Because what happens is, is when you distill all of that information down and then you look at the common elements there, you'll see the type of customer that you should be working on, working with rather, and then the, the opposite, right? Like when you start to divulge into the sales conversations, you're like, oh, this is a red flag, this is a red flag they're ticking the boxes that I don't want to work with. And so you'll start, that's the first initial step in essentially specializing your business so that you can then go ahead and present solutions while they could be custom um, that address a certain pain point and a certain person and a certain company and business uh, over and over and over again. And you could talk the same language and start to put these processes in sales and marketing in place to then bring in even one off projects. Okay. So this is the basic concept. So let's uh, take an example of an agency owners who, you know, offer all kinds of services for building websites, maintaining and all that stuff. Now, how does those uh, people who are in this web agency stuff, how does one identify and decide what new services that can be offered on recurring basis, which will obviously form the, you know, the quantum of, you know, the predictable income. Um, is there a methodology besides, you know, checking out like, I like doing this. I don't like doing that. Yeah. You want to look at for one, <clears throat> aside from maintenance, you want to look at potentially smaller chunks of bigger projects that you always do with those ideal clients. Mm -hmm. So it could be something like, Hey, look, we're always as a, let's just say, for example, you're a design agency, as you mentioned, the, let's just say we do a brand identity on the front end of every single project but we don't do those as one offs, right? And let's just say the, the, the big project is $20,000. The brand identity exercise, which you run through everybody could be $5,000. And then there's that deliverable at the end of it. And so you could carve out smaller pieces that you know you can deliver quickly and effectively and profitably, most importantly, on, on as those predictable pieces because one, they may lead into the bigger projects, but two, you can, you know, like, Hey, this brand identity takes three weeks to do or whatever. I'm a developer, so I don't know specifically, but you know, it takes three weeks to, to do, um, which means you can then go ahead and schedule out these sort of things. If you have a team, you know, you can handle five of these in every three weeks or whatever, then you know, you could do maybe five a month or 10 a month or 20 a month. And then that's when you start to have those predictable income and then optimize those processes around those sort of smaller projects. Um, the thing that you want to also look at is things that you may be doing on a consistent basis or recurring basis, if you will, with clients. So for me, I work in the e-commerce space. So there's holiday sales, especially with my clients that are, you know, selling products or, you know, whether it's physical or digital, you know, there's holidays, there's end of year sales, there's certain things that always come up on a, on a consistent basis time and time again. So I can look to carve out a piece of that and say, Hey, look, I know, you know, if we're recording this at the end of July, um, I know that back to school is coming up in a couple of months. Have you thought about these things? And you could start to sell strategies, uh, strategy sessions around these sort of events. And you could start to uh, carve out implementation products of these sort of events. And you could start to identify areas in which, yes, while you may have those big one-off projects um, that bring in the bread and butter for your business, but these smaller pieces, which are lower risk to the client buying in because they're not investing a lot of money and a lot of time into your bigger $20,000 projects, they're more likely to convert a lot faster and more predictable. Yeah, because it, I think productization of services is what we are, I guess, talking about here. Like a lot of 
agencies nowadays like an agency would charge twenty thousand dollars for a project one time vis-a-vis -vis now agencies have started doing like we'll charge you one thousand dollar per month with a commitment of two years and we'll build your website and maintain it so basically is that the you know thing what we are discussing in here like yeah essentially i mean a product is like a productized service for me anyway like the the actual definition of it is 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 like you're pulling a box off the shelf and mm -hmm. you buy this thing and you have the certain deliverable now i've built my business around productizing everything other than the actual solution meaning I've productized all the processes around sales and marketing in my business, client management and things of that nature so that everybody goes through essentially my business in the same way. Now, what I specialize in and what I deliver to my clients is basically handling their online business for them, their website, their email marketing platform, basically make it such that the things that they don't want to handle and they don't want to be in the day to day on, um, I help them just handle that for them but i also am there to give them consultation and strategy sessions around their email marketing that's really what they're hiring me for so that over time every single month we have certain projects that we're working on some clients there are you know we're running facebook ads to webinar landing pages other clients were running card abandonment campaigns like so those kind of custom projects that i'm working on with with customers with clients may be different each and individual one, but the deliverability of what I'm providing to them is all the same. So that's, that's really what I productize. Okay. And when we are going from, you know, fixed one time fees to monthly fees for something specific or some piece of work, deciding on pricing can be a little tricky for people who are not used to, you know, the month on month basis. Is there any methodology on deciding that pricing strategy? Because, now you just gave an example that you manage various e-commerce stores for people. I'm sure for every client you will have a different package. It's not a fixed thing, right? Um, essentially, I mean, I have a couple of different tiers um, okay. and they kind of fall into those tiers. Um, and the tiers are really, essentially I'm doing the same work, giving the same effort of level of both strategy and implementation. It's just the different tiers is, how much time do they need for me as well as how are we communicating? Are we having zoom calls every single week? Um, or can we do this over email instead? And so I try to fit the need. My pricing is based around what the needs of my clients are. And it goes back to what I said earlier is really understanding what your clients are. Uh, you know, when I first started out, I was like, uh, okay, I signed up the base camp. I did all of these things that that supposedly clients wanted <laughs> they don't. and then all right and then I found out that my clients didn't want another login to something they didn't want to log into a ticket system they didn't want to log into a project management system they just wanted to communicate where they communicated already which was email so then I fit my business I just signed up for help scout throw an email address where they can hit me at there and then on the back end of my business now I've built in the systems to go into my project management system and, and things of that nature. So I try to cater my, I, I try to price it around the needs of my clients and what they're trying to get from me, you know, as a deliverable, like what I'm delivering to them is probably the same for each and every single client, right? Implementation of you know, email sequences and onsite personalization and these other things. But some people don't need the weekly calls. Some people yeah. are fine with just sending me the emails. And so uh, I kind of try to meet them where they're at at that point. That's, that's one aspect of the pricing. The second aspect of the pricing is obviously I try to allow each and every single client to get an extreme ROI on their investment with me. So what I try to do, and I try to do this as early as possible rather, is to understand exactly what it is that I'm solving for them and mm -hmm. how expensive it is for them right now. So this could be, you know, if it's getting more customers, okay, so how, how much is a customer worth to you? If it's essentially eliminating copy and paste data sort of stuff that goes around, it could be just, hey, I'm sending weekly emails, I'm sending, you know, this and that to other segments and all that, and it's just taking me a lot of time to do that stuff. Like, okay, what would you rather be doing and how much does that cost you? 
Right? And so trying to figure out exactly what the pain point is that I'm solving for them and trying to deduce what that dollar amount is for them so that then I can position my service to them in a no brainer, right? Rather than them saying, I could pay somebody a hundred dollars a, a an hour to do this work. Like, why would I pay you an effective hourly rate of $300, right? And so yeah. I try to position my pricing in a way where it's a no brainer. Like if I, if they, if I ask somebody to pay me a thousand dollars a month, but I know from what I'm doing, I can turn that back around to $10,000. They're going to, it's going to be a no brainer. Yeah. That is where most people, you know, fall down actually uh, when offering these kind of services because clients will push you very hard and you know you gave the right example like i'm why should i pay you 300 dollars when i can get this done on one time charge from someone else for 100 dollars so but i guess uh, what i have realized i personally have stopped doing recurring monthly stuff almost 3 4 years back but i'm planning to get back into it but only for selected few because earlier managing things were a little difficult we don't have all we didn't have those kind of saas stuff you know tools to manage things like i'm talking about 5 6 years ago when mm -hmm. even migrating a wordpress site was very painful because you got to do it manually but now things have changed and now even people are realizing that if you have someone on a monthly help, it's like just like your go to person and you have sense of, you know, satisfaction and security. Oh, if something breaks, I, I know I can call Jason and he will fix it. So I guess that that, that can be one value selling proposition. Now, sticking to the same thought, now reaching out to clients that are interested in your recurring services rather than the one time, you know, pricing stuff. What are a few do's and don'ts when you're building your marketing plan or showcasing them these are our value points that will attract you to attract clients to your recurring business model well that's a big question but um <laughs> yeah i mean it's 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 uh to do the don'ts is is you first of all don't assume that they know exactly what you're what you're selling right and your solution so i try to always try to figure out where they are in that buyer journey are they do they even know they have a problem or are they close to that buying decision? They know all the bullet points in your feature list, let's say. Um, so I try to understand where they are. And that context usually plays into where I'm meeting them. Like, so is it a LinkedIn or Facebook group versus are, am I talking to them through email or things of that nature? So um, I try to figure out where they are in that buyer journey and then provide value to them in a way that makes sense in the context of that quote unquote sandbox, if you will. And so ironically enough, I don't do a lot of outreach to try to find clients. Um, how I've built my business is much of contributing value into the communities that I'm a part of. I've mm -hmm. specialized my business. You know, first I I came from a Ruby on Rails background and a Java background. Um, and it was, well, nine, so it was about seven years ago, I decided to focus only on WordPress. And that was as a result of what my clients needed, right? Because I was building CMS systems in Ruby on Rails and they weren't always in there every single day. And it became complex for them to even update simple things. And so I had narrowed down on, WordPress, but because I love e-commerce space um, and most developers run away from the e-commerce space, I, I was like, I can plant my flag. Uh, and at that time, and I really fell backwards into it, but at that time, I liked WooCommerce versus WP e-commerce or any of the other plugins that were out there at the time. Um, so I hitched my wagon to WooCommerce. And I subsequently even went further and I specialized in uh, subscriptions for WooCommerce and, and the team over at Prosperous. So obviously that was pure luck by me choosing WooCommerce. I chose it for my own opinions and how I could work with it and all that stuff. But when automatic... No, it's the <laughs> default option. Yeah. It's, I mean, the other ones aren't even there at this point. So I was lucky in that regard. But... Um, I added to those communities. I jumped into conversations, people asking questions and things of that nature. And people would come to me saying, hey, I hear you're the WooCommerce guy, 
right? Or you're the subscriptions guy. Um, and so just by providing value into those communities and those aspects um, allowed people to find me rather than me going to find them. And the side effect of that was, was that folks like Brent at Prosperous, you know, and, you know, in my business now with ConvertKit and Drip even, because I added value to their community, their support team know who I was. And when they get those custom requests, which they're not going to change their product for one-off customers, they say, hey, Jason knows how to do this stuff. So here's his contact information. And they send me inbound leads that help, you know, that convert into clients for me. So I always encourage everybody, especially if you're going to target a specific platform is to really understand the platform, use it, communicate with, with their support team, with their sales team, even their founder, if you can. Um, and so that you plant your flag with them as, Hey, I'm, I'm, I love this product and I'm going to advocate for you. And, and if you hear of anybody that needs some help, I'd be happy to help. Yeah. Because you know, this concept of giving value and, you know, showing your visibility in an ecosystem. I've been following that ever since. I don't do it intentionally. Obviously, it comes naturally to me because, and it will only come naturally to you or anyone because if someone tries to do it artificially, you can easily identify that person. And same for me, like all the tools that I use, I build, you know, knowledge base, build the, you know, community around it and, you know, just share what you know about that specific platform and tool. And, business and referrals do come in naturally but guess what majority of people are not interested in doing this and they just want they just want clients they don't want to give anything yeah. just they want it and that is where my next question comes in and i'm sure you don't do it but would you recommend cold email market email outreach to you know have a marketing plan to get such kind of recurringly interested uh, clients who are interested in recurring services I do with a caveat. First, do warm outreach. I'm a huge advocate of warm outreach, meaning I look at other folks that I have relationships with, their colleagues, and I call them colleagues. Most people will call them competitors. As a business owner, um, I only need a handful of clients to keep me sustainable. So mm. you know, other folks that also do WooCommerce development or even WordPress development or all the way down to subscriptions development, I have close relationships with all those people. And so I always reach out to them on a consistent basis, maybe once a year, just to kind of say, hey, look, uh, I'm, I was working on this pretty interesting project and uh, you know, here's a couple of takeaways and bullets from that. Um, if you hear anybody that's interested in some sort of work or if you have overflow work that you want to refer me to, um, I'd be happy to. And it's just, add, again, it's to your point, it's adding value to them, but it's also why not they know exactly what you do. So there's less of an education there to, you know, have them pass along a referral. So I'll always do that warm outreach first and then cold outreach. It has to be personalized. It can't be these blanket emails that you send out everywhere that says, Hey, I do X, Y, and Z, and this is what I can do for you. Uh, here, book a call. Like it just, that does not work. Like I get, tons of those every single day and I'm just, it just goes right in the trash. Like I don't even bother with it. But if you take, and I did this early on in my, in my growing my business is go find those companies or websites or people, individuals that you can help with a potential solution. It could be like one of those low hanging carved out products that you, you built out mm -hmm. and see what you can do real quick, five, 10 minutes. What I did was for a long time, uh, especially initially was I would submit, I would go to their contact form and hit enter and just see if there was errors. Right. And there was always errors. And I would just say, hey, look, if you, I know that you're using this, if you just couple, go in your settings and I would create a quick video. And this was, this was six years ago, five years ago, I would do this stuff. Um, 
where, you know, I would give them a, a three minute video of actually how to fix their problem. And I would say, Hey, if you have any more questions or you want to have a conversation to help you grow your business or grow your website, uh, let's reach out. And so if you just spend 10 or 15 minutes to, to provide in, a quick win for them, that goes a long way in that cold outreach. Okay. So like you talk about cold outreach, now there are tools that can customize your cold outreach process. Yeah, like they will slap uh, your name on a t-shirt of an image. Like the, we have all kinds of fancy gadgets to do that. So let's switch gears from cold outreach to upselling. Now, uh, when you have clients on your recurring service subscription is upselling to get more value from existing clients an, an important part or you avoid doing that? I definitely don't avoid doing that. Um, even, in fact, while I'm engaged on a project, I will actually have a, a, a side document that is next phase, right? And so what that next phase document allows me to do is bookmark, if you will, um, opportunities for further upsells, if you will, right? And so um, I will always, <clears throat> when I'm engaged in a project and, and one of these come up, client wants to do it and say, awesome. Uh, I think this is probably best suited for next phase because I want to stay on target with this goal. Um, unless you really think that this is that important, but the consequences of doing this now will slide out this or it'll cost extra or whatever, or both. Um, I really outline that for them. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty blunt about, you know, the upsells and things of that nature. Um, because I want the most from them. I'll go through that wholesale, like that ROI process again with them to say, you know, Hey, look, if we spend a week on doing this, it's going to be an investment of $500 or whatever it is. But I know that, on, you know, let's just say it's in the fall. I know that Christmas time, you, your site is going to be better suited to handle some of these other things. And it could be just simple optimizations or something of that nature, but you're going to get more checkouts at the back end of it and position it in that way. Because I'm already involved in their business. I kind of know exactly the levers I can pull and what's going to resonate with them. So I'll look for those opportunities to present those back to the client. Okay, cool. Now let's get back to the example of web agency owner that we were you know, talking about previously. Now, when it comes to web agency that most people start at offering care plans and end at care plans, because that is what most people know as of now, like the education part. Now, as per your experience in coaching and consulting and even servicing various agency owners, besides care plans, what creative radical services have you noticed from agency owners that can act that can actually work in building that predictable revenue stream yeah a lot of it is consultation uh mm -hmm. and strategy um care plans for me i've <laughs> and it's funny because I'm, I'm i'm i and we probably know a lot of the similar same people that advocate care plans at, and for me i always while i offer those services and backups and security scans and all that for my clients. Um, it's not something that I even promote to my clients. It's just part of what I provide to them. What I promote is helping them to grow their business rather than position, you know, those sort of tools. I position the benefits, right? And so for me, what I look to is, Hey, we're having weekly scrum calls. I can see the data. I'm going to analyze your data. We're going to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, those sort of things work. Flip side of it is, is some of the other customers that I have are online coaches. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> whether it's online coaches, but it's, it's people that also sell services of some sort. And so when they bring in leads into their business um i've had i've been alongside them in sales calls and i've positioned that as an add-on into my services because i'm basically brought on as in in some cases as a sales engineer so technically i can answer some some sales questions that come up um, on other cases i'm actually leading the sales call where because they're are not 
where my customers are not as comfortable with sales just yet, which I don't consider myself a salesperson, but it's just the nature of the beast. Um, they want more guidance initially as, hey, how do you do your sales goals? Like you seem, you closed me well, and I didn't even realize that all well, the next thing I know I'm paying you, right? And so, so they've wanted that sort of, of, a, of, a, of an add-on, if you will. And so these sort of things, again, it's servicing your clients and what their needs are. And so I just keep these, I, I keep an eye open for these opportunities where I can say, hey, it, that is just a part of my time. I'm not even actually writing any code for this stuff. I can easily offer that if I sense the next person coming along is starting to lead me down that path. And I can say, hey, I offer this too. You know, and these sort of predictable, and that's why I say it's predictable because I know if I get a couple of these people into my business in that way, well, maybe I don't have to do you know the one-off projects anymore because yeah. now I've added on a couple of things on to several other clients, um, then I don't have to go do that one off project. Yeah, very insightful. Now you mentioned positioning tools as against benefits is one of the mistakes a lot of people do. What are few other mistakes that people do while building this predictable revenue stream? Talking in the language that you talk versus how they present themselves, right? Yeah. And so let's talk about know, press. <laughs> I mean, you know, it like I was just, I, I had a coaching client earlier on and he's building out a landing page and, you know, he talked about, and he services uh, creative ad professionals, right? Mm -hmm. And these, you know, the titles are, you know, director of photography and all these other things. And so he was like, I'm not sure what, what, what noun to put in this headline. And so I said, well, is that what they call themselves? He's like, not really. I said, so then remove that. And talk about the pain point. Like, what are you selling? You're selling better portfolios, right? So do, is your portfolio performing, you know, properly? So that's what they're going to identify with. They're not going to come to there and say, oh, creative ad professional? I don't even know who, what that is, right? And so, so you want to talk in the language that they talk in. How do they, you know, like as a developer, yes, like while, you know, I talk about page speed and optimization and yeah. database and all the rest of it. My clients don't know anything about any of that stuff. They don't, they just say my site's slow. Uh, you know, when I load up my you know, site on my phone, it takes forever. Right. And like, so you talk I, and it took me a while because I did this for a long time on my website where I talked about the features like custom plugin development, uh, database management, speed optimization. Like I had that bullet list, but flip it on its side a little bit and say, okay, what does this one bullet item benefit to the customer? Page speed? Okay. That means faster checkout, increased search results, and all these other things. So trying to, to, to relate to their language is a big thing. And it's hard for a lot of us to do. Um, you know, a lot of business owners that I run into, they don't even care that it's WordPress. Right? And like, they're just like, I don't care. I just need a site that works for me and I can manage and I, that's going to sell my thing or bring people into my store or whatever it is. Um, if WordPress is it, great. So remove all of that stuff if you can or translate it in a way where it makes sense to the person that's going to ultimately buy from you. Now, we've been talking about predictable income and recurring, you know, way of doing things or providing services. Now, Let's flip the canvas a little. If someone is involved in, you know, this recurring and predictable income, is doing one-time online, you know, works still can be an important part of the mix, or you should go all recurring and predictable. Uh, I think one time definitely. I still, while most of my business is recurring. Um, I still very much do one-time projects. I'm more selective about them mm -hmm. and it allows me to be, be that way. But you know, one, there is a place where people don't need the recurring service and why not serve them in the way w in which they need. Right. So, you know, case in point, I had somebody come as a lead uh, into my business that 
essentially was a coach, online coach, um, that serviced uh, a personal, you know, family issue that I had with some relatives, but he does it in an online way. It's not like they work together, but it was close to my heart. And so I wanted to help them in any way that I could. And so I said, okay, that's fine. They may not have the budget for the full recurring stuff, but there was some low hanging fruit that I could solve for him. And I did so. And so there's, but if I needed the money, like if I was just doing one off projects, I may have passed on him or not had the opportunity to take him on or something of that nature because I was locked up or whatever. Um, but the recurring allowed me to then go ahead and be selective about, Hey, yeah, I can fit him into my schedule um, because it's, you know, obviously important to him, but it's, it's close to my heart and I want to be able to help. And so one off totally does. And to, to the point earlier is when you carve out those initial kind of low hanging fruits, those could be one off and you know, those aren't going to be recurring, but they're predictable because you can sell them in a, a much faster way. There's a, a, a shorter sales cycle and all of that. So you can get that predictable income coming through. Okay. So let's summarize a little bit. So, someone who's listening to this episode and is only or have only done the one time thing and never went into the recurring or predictable income stream work. What are three quick things you will suggest to that kind of an audience or that type of person who wants to get into this predictable revenue stream? Yeah, it's super simple. Basically look at your existing client base and figure out who you enjoy working with and mm -hmm what you do for them. And then on the flip side of that is for all of those types of projects, what did you do implementation wise for each and every single one that you can carve out as a small piece, as a small product, um, and then offer that on an easier way. It could just be a landing page that you have that, or downsell in a sales conversation, something of that nature that just is quick, simple, that you know that you can sell. Whereas if you, you know, bigger projects are $10,000, this thing is 500. Obviously that's easier to sell than the 10,000. Cool. So now let's shift gears and talk about your toolbox. So which are your current five favorite tools that power your online business? So uh, I try to keep all of my toolbox minimal. Um, but one big tool for me is Zapier. Or Zapier. How or Zapier. <laughs> right. I, th I think actually they came out and said it's, it's exactly like happier. So that's yeah. why I was <laughs> um, So that's one big thing. Um, another tool that I use is uh, um, Pipedrive. That's mm -hmm. my CRM. Okay. Uh, ConvertKit. Uh, Formula and, Grip. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for I know. Dream. I know the controversy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, but yes, but obviously, I mean, there's benefits that, of why I went to ConvertKit anyway. Um, but yeah, so I would say for me, Zapier, PipeDrive, ConvertKit, WordPress, obviously, um, and uh, Slack. Okay, and. Since you manage a lot of clients, I'm sure you also manage their hosting. So which is your recommended hosting service provider? I, well, I have a recommended hosting provider. I don't necessarily manage their hosting. I just manage their account. But, right. And so I oftentimes, if it's a WordPress site, I will recommend WP Engine. Mm -hmm. um, it's reliable. I believe you let them purchase their own hosting and, you know, do their own billing and you just manage it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah that's, I, that's how I view it. Like being, you know, there to help a client rather than being a hosting provider myself. Like a lot of people do that. Like they will buy a big dedicated server and throw up all the sites there. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to manage that. I just will, I want to be the essentially their liaison to their host because I can understand what the host is telling them. So if there's a problem, but I don't want to be responsible for, and this is a good thing. It's like, I do that same thing with the plugin licensing too. Is like, yeah. I, I bundle up the plugins for them and essentially build the cart and tell them what to buy. And then the license is owned by them, not me. Uh, just so that, you know, it's, it's clean. If they, if once the engagement is over, 
there's not all this transferring and yeah uh, there's no controversy on breakups right, right exactly right so and no mess life, yeah it keeps my life simple <laughs> exactly that's how it should be and i always wondered why should i become a hosting company for yeah. you know clients to do it if i am factoring in that 20 30 dollars per month in my price let them pay it and let me deduct that from whatever i'm charging right exactly right and i'm sure you use a page builder do you uh i've only started to and i still don't really uh to be honest with you i don't have a like a go to one that i've used um on my own site i've started to mess around with elementor but uh for for a lot of my you know clients i inherit what they have and while i improve or sometimes re architect their their site i don't have a go to page builder necessarily sometimes it's not warranted considering you like the simplicity of convertkit you should try beaver builder <laughs> i've heard <laughs> that too it's just i don't know it's i don't know it's just it's it's a, the ui is very simple mm. but it's not as fancy as elementor so that's the warning <laughs> prior to usage so my next question which can be controversial for you which is a recommended email marketing service <laughs> yeah it's not so controversial but <laughs> to be honest with you i mean we were joking about it but at the same time there it, i and i always i've always said from the start even before i started my business i want the business to drive the technology not the other way around and so once i understand the needs then i'll offer up the technology and so while most people will fall into the convert kit realm and i would probably 80% you know say that uh there are features and things that are needed that convert kit can't do and drip is better for or active campaign is better yeah. for or infusionsoft and so that's kind of how i sit while you know, if somebody just off the street says, hey, what email marketing platform do you recommend? I will say ConvertKit. Um, but if when a business comes to me and really needs it for their solution, I will unpack what their needs are. Cool. Conditions apply, right? <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> okay, so last question. Any upcoming tool or service that has caught your attention? I recently? Um... That's a great question. Um, I've been looking at Notion a lot. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have talked about that on the podcast recently. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's funny because the thing is, is like, and you know, like, I I bullet journal, right? And I, I've, I've oh, and this is a funny ongoing conversation that I've had with Curtis McHale for years at this point, mm -hmm. uh, who's a developer, and 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 so I. It, I've used Evernote, I've used, you know, a plethora of different note taking sort of apps. Uh, I love writing, especially like when I'm having a conversation, like I can't type while I'm having a conversation, but I can write and, yeah. and just notation and all that stuff. But I've never had like an all encompassing <laughs> way in which to know that, hey, if I go here, I'll have that information. Um, Evernote was close, um, but I like to write Markdown and Evernote can't. And so there's all these sort of things. So Notion has appealed to me in a way where it's like, there's bits of like Airtable in there. There's bits of, you can write in Markdown. You can, you can create databases in there and have them on views on different pages. So I've started to try to see if I can do my project management in there and like, like a whole plethora of different flexibility options in there. And so it's been interesting to mess around in there. And I've found myself at night sitting on the couch, going down the notion rabbit hole of <laughs> what I can do inside of there. But uh, yeah, that's something that's, that's intrigued me. Yeah. I've heard good things about it, but I am more of a, you know, my note taking happens in a notepad file or in a draft mode in Gmail. That's about it. And guess what? It works for me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, there are so many fancy tools you can use, just like you mentioned a few of them. But obviously Notion is getting good uh, vibe and reviews for a lot of people. A few people did mention Notion in previous episodes. So I guess it's worth trying. So before we wrap this episode, where can people find you and what can you help people with? Yeah, um, you can find me at res.com, 
that's R E Z Z Z dot com or on Twitter, same thing, Rez. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about or unpacking more about what we talk about here, um, hop on my newsletter. Uh, it's right there on the homepage. Uh, I learn out loud. So while I help mentor, you know, other developers and designers, I'm never getting away from the services side and I always want to work, you know, do things that work in today's market where a lot of other mentors and coaches get away from that sort of thing. So, um, I learn out loud. So if you're on my newsletter, you know what I'm working on real time. Like I talk and I say, Hey, I'm doing this and that and the other, um, before, you know, a podcast might come out or a blog post gets posted. Um, so you'll get the real behind the scenes kind of stuff on the newsletter there. Curious in your domain name, why extra Z's? <laughs> I, that's all awesome. I'm glad you asked that because <clears throat> it can Rez, be your name, real name. It can be a real name. Well, I mean, obviously Rez is like the short version of my Rez last name. name. Yep. But, and that's what I grew up with. My friends always called me Rez and all that. So, but when I played video games, I was Rez with two Z's. Okay. And <laughs> what happened was like, you know, when you create your name, I, and this was, I remember this, it was Diablo that came out and Battle.net and you yeah. know, back in the 90s. And so uh, I typed in Res and it was taken. And I was like, oh, this, like, what? Who's That's taking this? problem with common names. And so I just added an extra Z and it was there. And I just right. stuck around with it and through today. And like when I was in college, I had no idea what I was going to build. So I wound up buying res.com and messing around and putting animated GIFs on the page and all that stuff. And it was a domain name that was short and memorable. And so I just carried that through. It's just an old domain name. And I was like, all right, I can build a business around this. It's fine. You know, but it's funny. People always, people sometimes wonder but they don't ask why there's three Z's. Uh, but yeah, that, that's the story behind it because I was essentially lazy to come up with another game, video game handle and I just kept on yeah. adding. A common name became a unique name just by adding one extra Z. So all those people who are listening, it's R-E-Z-Z-Z three times and .com, right? Exactly right, yep. Okay, Jason, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure it was enjoyable for you to be on the mm-hmm. show. So in the meantime, have a good day. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It was great.